Welcome to the Nord Stage 3 Synthesizer Training. This is part three. If you missed part two and part one, I encourage you to go back there and watch those parts because this training really does work best if you watch it in order. And there are things that I won't even cover in part three because I've already covered it in part one and two, such as configuring your synth at a starting point where all the default settings are back to zero. So I won't even be covering that here in part three. So be sure to watch um, the earlier parts. And this particular version, this part three, is all about filtering. This is the Nord Stage 3 filter section. And it's an important thing to know because in order to understand modulation, which is part four, you really have to know what it is you're modulating. And in many cases, that's uh, the filter and the filter aspects of the synthesizer. Uh, in addition to filtering, we're going to be talking about the KB track functionality, a little bit about what that does. We'll briefly explore the drive option, which is adding drive to the filter itself. And then we'll end the video with vibrato, because even though that's a simple thing to understand, it actually uh, is a little deeper than you would first suspect. So we'll talk about vibrato and what's that all about. So let's get started with the filter. I thought we would take a look at the Nord definition of it because uh, they tend to do a pretty good job of explaining what it is. And then uh, what we do here in these videos is we take what, what the book says and we put it to practical use and look at it firsthand. So the filter is an important component in shaping the overall timbre of the sound and can be modulated by a number of sources. And modulation is the idea of fluctuating that sound over time. And that's where, where things get really exciting. But we need to understand what filters are and how they work first before we can talk about modulation. The Nord Stage 3 features a selection of both classic and innovative synthesizer filters. Most filters share the same parameters. Uh, those two parameters are the frequency and more specifically the frequency cutoff. And that controls the cutoff frequency here with this knob. And that's why it's in red. I assume that's why it's in red because it's such an important knob when it comes to filtering here on the synth and so much is derived from this cutoff. And then the second knob here, which is the resonance knob, that controls the resonance uh, of the filter resonance, which we'll learn about here in a little bit. And for every filter configuration except one, which is the LP and HP. And the LP and HP stands for low pass and high pass filter. Those filters are running simultaneously in that particular configuration. And that way, when that happens, these knobs dictate the cutoff of both those filters respectively. So that's the uh, only thing you need to know about. So this knob is resonance every other situation except for this where it becomes the cutoff for the high pass filter. Now, before we talk about the filter configuration specifically, I want to bring an important note to your attention. You may notice that there's no actual way to turn off the filter. No matter what you do, one of those lights is going to be illuminated, indicating that the filter is on. And that is 100% true. The filter doesn't ever shut off on the synth. However, you don't necessarily have to have the filter on because if you put your frequency knob uh, at 10 in this case with the low pass filter LP12, that's what that stands for. If I have my frequency knob at 10, it means that that frequency cutoff is all the way to the far right of the frequency spectrum. In fact, so far right that the filter isn't even on, meaning the frequency cutoff is outside the range, it's all the way to 10, and there is no filter happening. So the reason why there's no way to turn off the filter is because you really turn off the filter or dictate where the filter frequency cutoff is by this knob. So this knob is, in a sense, your on-off button for the filter. Okay, first, there are six different configurations. We have the LP12, which stands for the low-pass filter, 12 decibel, and that will be explained better in, when we read through it. Then you have the low-pass 24, which is essentially the same type of filter, except that it reduces the volume by 24 decibels per octave versus 12 decibels per octave on the LP12. Then you have this interesting filter, which is the LPM, and that is a 24 decibel filter, just like the LP24, except it has a different personality trait. It's uh, modeled after the famous Moog filter, and we'll read about that here in a second. Then you have the filter here called LP plus HP. We talked about it just a second ago, and that filter is essentially two filters. It's both a low pass filter happening at the same time as a high pass filter, so those two filters are working in tandem. Then you have the BP filter, which is band pass, and this is an interesting filter 
which we'll talk about here in a second, and then finally the high pass filter. So essentially, these are all filtering the same thing, and that is frequencies. And the frequencies, think of the old, um, back in the 80s where we used to have stereos and we used to be proud of our stereos. We had the amplifier and the big speakers and the subwoofer. And then, of course, it wouldn't be complete unless you had one of those long EQs and you could move the frequencies up and down. And essentially, this is the exact same thing. This frequency cutoff determines where we start uh, trimming those frequencies up or down. And when we talk about cutting them off, we're talking about lowering their volume or raising their volume. That's it. There's, there's nothing fancy going on. We're just literally taking a frequency on that spectrum and either making it louder or quieter. And that's all these filters are doing. With that said, let's get down to business here. Let's take a look at the default filter, which is the LP12, and read about that. So it is a low pass filter, which means it allows the low frequencies to pass through, meaning you're going to hear low frequencies uh, more than you're going to hear high frequencies when you start playing with the frequency knob. So if you think of this frequency knob here, this knob here, when it's on 10, think of the frequency spectrum and think of that cutoff starting at 10 and moving to the left and slowly but surely cutting off those high frequencies in a curve-like fashion. In fact, we can see a picture of it here. And the LP12 stands for 12 decibels for every octave. So the LP12 setting provides 12 dB octave low-pass filter, which retains more harmonics than the LP24 setting. A 12 dB filter is also known as a two-pole filter. Versus the LP24 setting, with an atten attenuation slope of 24 dB per octave, is a more classic synth filter. It cuts out frequencies rather drastically with a slope of 24 dB per octave. And a, dB, a 24 dB filter is also known as a four-pole filter. So let's listen to the differences here. I'm going to load up a classic saw wave. And I'm going to start with my frequency on 10 and load up my spectrum analyzer with GarageBand. And yes, I have a tone. I'm just going to play the C above middle C and start with 10 here on the frequency knob. And we'll start reducing those high frequencies in a nice, smooth fashion. And you can see here, um, when I have it on 10, keep your eyes focused on that far left line. And you'll notice that it doesn't move an inch as I move that knob until I get to the very, until I get to about five on the frequency, you'll see it now it's starting to finally diminish because it's letting the low frequencies pass through. Now, another thing to pay attention to is as you move this knob, but look at the center LED um, and you'll see that it shows you the range. If I go all the way to zero, my filter frequency is 14 hertz. If I go all the way to the right, it's 21 kilohertz. So again, that represents the spectrum of where that line is. That's the line in the sand, in a sense, as to where it's going to start cutting off those frequencies. And in, because this is a low pass filter, only the frequencies on the right side, the high frequencies, are being diminished because the low is allowed to pass. Now, it's completely the opposite when you talk about high pass filter. It's the exact same thing in reverse. In fact, let's do that right now. Let's go to the high pass filter. And if I start on 10, it's going to have a different effect. I actually have to start on 0 and move to 10 in order for you to hear uh, something similar in my example. So we'll do that same C key. And I'll start going from 0 up. And right now we're cutting off the low frequencies and leaving just the high frequencies, high pass filter, allowing the high frequencies to pass. And that's really that simple, how these filters work. Now, of course, uh, you have to play around with them and learn their personality traits. But then when you start modulating these filters, meaning move them up and down through time using the different uh, options we have here on the Nord Stage 3, uh, it really becomes exciting and interesting. All right, so that's the low pass filter 12. So again, let's review. We'll go from 10 to zero. And it's a nice smooth, when I get to about five, I still have four lines showing. Okay, now let's take a look at the LP24, which is a more dramatic effect. Again, that's 24 dBs per octave going down. Uh, go from 10 to five and we'll watch the difference. This time I'm left with two and one little, maybe three lines. Not very many, so it has a more dramatic effect. More frequencies are being cut out uh, the more I bring that cutoff from right to left. 
So really, that's it. So you could say, well, so there's really not much of a difference. No, there isn't. These filters are essentially, they all do the same thing. They, they reduce or um, enhance frequencies on the spectrum. And the configuration is just how much or how they work. Now the LP12, or excuse me, the LPM, which is that one. Let's read about that one because that's sort of interesting. The LPM, the Low Pass M filter, provides an emulation of the original transistor filter from the famous Mini, and that Mini is from Moog. The groundbreaking and much-loved filter design was created and patented in the 1960s by Dr. Robert A. Moog. And, you know, it sort of became famous. The Moog became famous uh, for its sound. It was so unique. And um, this filter here emulates that personality. So let's listen to that. And remember, at its root, it's still an LP24 with a Moog approach to it. In fact, uh, let's talk about it just a little bit more. The M filter is a four pole. So that's again, the 24 dB octave resonating low pass filter. The character of the filter resonance is one detail that makes it stand out, leaving more of the low end of the signal um, than on the 24 dB octave. So let's just listen to the LP24 versus the LPM. And I'll play in the low register because I think you'll be able to hear the lower notes a little better. So I'll just play a little pattern here. And I'll reduce the frequency cutoff here. And so nice rounded sound at five. Now let's change it to the LPM. It feels different and unique, different than the LP24. Let me bring more frequency out. Let's keep it at an eight and compare the two. Now the LPM. So there's some subtleties there. I mean, it's pretty close. They're still at their very uh, nature. The, the filters are similar, but it does provide that LPM option. And if you're going for something specific or you want to mimic something more closely to what the Moog originally did, that LPM filter may come in very handy. Okay, I'm going to skip the LPHP for now because that's the most advanced in my opinion and skip right to the bandpass filter and then we'll come back to the other one in a second. So the bandpass filter is one of my favorites because um, it, it's unique. It's, it's got its own personality trait, if you will. The BP or bandpass filter allows frequencies close to the filter frequency cutoff, in this case, setting to pass, while frequencies above and below the cutoff are attenuated or diminished. Uh, this can, for instance, be used for programming narrow, nasal, or very controlled sounds. It's exact character depending on filter frequency and resonance settings. So remember this resonance, we haven't really learned about that yet, but this in conjunction with this uh, can make for some interesting things. So the bandpass filter, think of that cutoff uh, as you move it up and down, the slope of the curve where those frequencies are. So think of you taking that EQ and just taking your hands and sort of squishing down the right and left as you move left and right. All right, so let's listen to that. Uh, we'll start with the frequency way on the right, and this really becomes obvious when you see it visually here. Uh, I'll just play a C, and you can see when I have my bandpass filter all the way to the right, all I'm getting are those just those high frequencies there in a little curve. And as I move down, so it's like taking, you know, the spectrum and only listening to uh, the part that you want to accentuate. And that's the bandpass filter. Okay, the next filter is the high pass filter. We sort of already talked about that a little bit uh, when we talked about the low pass filter, and it's really kind of the opposite, except that the high pass filter runs at a 24 dB versus a 12. So the high pass filter is similar to the LP24. All right, so that's how that works. And, and when you move that cutoff, you're taking off the low part of the frequency. Okay, now let's look at this one. This is the LP and the HP combined, and it looks like this. Let's read about it. The combined low pass, high pass filter consists of a 12 dB low pass and a 12 dB high pass filter in parallel. The filter frequency knob controls the cutoff frequency of the LP filter, and the resonance knob controls the cutoff frequency of the high pass filter. That resonance knob over here, uh, this becomes the filter frequency cutoff for the high pass filter 
in this one scenario, and that's why it's in red, and that's why this is in red, so you can see clearly what that does. All right, so let's play with this. This is very interesting. Um, first, let's just turn off all the filtering whatsoever, and in order to do that, you would uh, put zero here on the frequency knob for the low pass, and then for the high pass, you'd put it on 10, because remember, they sort of work in opposites, coming together like this, where those frequency cutoffs are coming together. So I have the high pass frequency on 10, so it's over here, low pass frequency on zero, and meaning I'm not gonna hear anything when I play. So I'm just gonna put on my KB hold here and play a wide range of sound. Can't hear it at the moment. So first I'm going to take my low pass filter and turn it on, allowing more of those low frequencies to pass through. Here they come. That's up to a five, which is about a 622 hertz. Okay, and I'm gonna turn that off. Then I'm gonna take my high pass filter cut off and move that so that it releases some of those high frequencies. Here they come. Now if I put them both on about halfway, about five. Okay, so now if I move them both to their opposites, I hear an actual louder than it would be uh, in other words, those frequencies overlap, and I actually am making more frequency come through. It's actually getting louder. In fact, it says it right here. It says, the combination is highly useful for extensive tonal shaping of any source, allowing for cutting the range between the two cutoff frequencies, or for enhancing a particular range with overlapping filter ranges. So that part where it enhances, you can actually bring those filter frequencies together and overlap and actually have more volume in that frequency range than you would otherwise. So the LPHP filter, if set a certain way, will actually make your keyboard a little louder um, based on its configuration than it would be if you just had a regular LP12 at uh, frequency 10, for example. So just keep that in mind when you're playing around with this. That really is it for the filtering in terms of understanding that. So let's move on to the next part, which is KB tracking. Let's read about that first, because it's a little confusing when you first hear about what KB tracking is. The reason for controlling keyboard track is related to basic acoustics. If the pitch of a waveform is raised, the harmonics naturally raise in frequency as well. If the cutoff frequency is constant, the sound will be perceived as getting muddier the higher up the keyboard you play. To avoid this effect, use the KB track. So let me explain this if I can. It's, it's not an easy thing to explain necessarily, but it helps a little bit when you see it visually. If I take a traditional saw wave and I start at the low end, um, you'll see that the saw wave, in it, as its very nature, it has the, the basic fundamental note and then the harmonics of the saw wave um, spread through the spectrum, going to the right, each one getting a little quieter and a quieter. And that's essentially the personality of the saw wave. Now, as I move up the range, you'll see that that line, that slope, follows my note beautifully. Again, I'm not talking about KB, KB, KB tracking at this point, and I have no filter involved, so KB tracking, none of this is affected if my filter is at full, uh, where this cutoff is not being um, influencing the filter. In other words, the filter is not invoked you'll see that my slope follows my note beautifully. But if I take my frequency now and cut off, um, you know, half of the frequencies, 554 hertz, for example, right at five, and I do that same thing, as I play the low note, you see that nice slope and you see all the lines represented. But as I move up the keyboard, you'll see less and less harmonics being represented. Look, I've only got four lines now. Now I've only got three lines. And way up here, I've only got two lines or so. It's changed its personality from a saw wave almost back to a sine wave because the frequency cutoff is right here at the middle of the, um, of the spectrum, right around here, right around the 500 hertz range, which means that we, you know, we are basically, we don't want to hear anything above 500 hertz. So that same note, which had its full presence down here at the bottom end of the spectrum, because that 500 there illuminated in green, is indicating, yeah, we're letting all those notes come through, all those frequencies come through. But as I move up the spectrum, that 500 says, now you can't pass past the 500. So that's why the sound becomes a little bit more muddy or dull as you go up the keyboard. Now watch what happens when I turn my KB tracking to full glory. In other words, all the way one. That's a one-to-one -one relationship. KB tracking is following and bringing my cutoff frequency. In a sense, it's taking that 500 and moving it up for me automatically as the keys move up the keyboard. So let's do that now. That same low note. 
And as I move up, look at my curve is following me. I, I almost have as many lines as I did. In fact, I should have the exact same many lines. Look at that. I'm way up here. Now listen how buzzy it is. It's still very buzzy, very much like a saw wave. So that KB track allows those frequencies to come out relative to where the note is on the pitch spectrum. So KB track is a neat way to keep the personality of those sounds uh, the same across the keyboard. Now there are cases where you want to do that and have KB tracking on and there are cases where you don't. Now exactly how and why you'd want to use one over the other, I can't really explain all of that right now, uh, nor do I really have a full appreciation nor have I thought about it long enough to think about why the KB tracking would be uh, useful one way or the other. But I can tell you that if you're trying to preserve the personality trait of a saw wave as you move up the spectrum, one way to do that is to keep, keep that KB tracking at a one to one ratio. So let's just quickly look at the different options you have. Zero, which no KB tracking. You saw that clearly how that works. Uh, those frequencies get cut off rather quickly based on where your knob is, of course. And, and the lower your knob is on the frequency spectrum, if you're using a low-pass filter, the more accentuated or the duller the sound will be going right. So the KB tracking really is a derivative of where your frequency knob is. So keep that in mind, too. All right, so you have off. You have one-third. That's where the cutoff frequency will track the keyboard in a one-to-three relationship. Played, uh, play one octave higher, and the cutoff frequency will move by a third of an octave. Now you have the two-thirds, which is the cutoff frequency will track a keyboard in a two to three relationship. Uh, play one octave higher and the cutoff frequency will move by two-thirds, or the one to one, which is it cuts off uh, an exact relationship to the keys you're playing. And let's look at that visually here on the little graph. You can see here's an example of one to one tracking, and here's an example of two-thirds tracking. And you can study this closely, pause the video if you want, and you can take a close look at this and kind of look at where the lines are going and kind of get your head around this. But I think it was easy to see quite clearly um, the KB tracking as we followed it along the spectrum analyzer just a minute ago. So it's a neat option to have. It's a good option to have because, um, you know, if you take it too literally, if you don't have that KB tracking on, basically the, the stage three is saying, okay, well, you told me to cut off at 500, so that's exactly what I'm going to do. But as a musician and as a performing uh, situation, you, you don't necessarily want it to take you too literally because you still want it to sound clear or um, you still want the sound to be have its integrity as what you meant for it to be when you played in the low register, for example. Next, we have the drive option. This adds drive to the filter. Okay, drive. Ac activating drive, which is the shift key and the KB track where we just were here. That's the drive option. You get three settings. Um, it adds distortion to the filter stage. Uh, you get setting one, two, and three, representing low, medium, and high amounts of drive, respectively. Uh, they make a quick footnote here that says using drive with the high filter resonance setting will often produce a fun or interesting result here. So let's see what we can do here. Let's put on the drive. We'll just keep a low pass filter here. I'll put the frequency right in the middle at a five, and we'll add some drive. So here's a regular C, and as I add the drive, I'll hold the shift key and add one drive. Two drive, you can hear it's a little buzzier. And there's full drive. Yeah, and it adds, you know, some drive. I wouldn't say it has the pronounced effect of using the drive option over here on our regular amp simulation settings where you can drive and overdrive it to the point of its massive distortion. But this is a nice, uh, you know, enhancement for the filter, and it can add some interesting effects. Now, it did mention that footnote where it said, why don't you use the resonance in conjunction with the drive to see what kind of options you have. Put some more drive on here. Yeah, it comes out electric guitar sound, especially if you modulate it manually here. And we're going to learn in you know part four, modulation is all about moving these frequency knobs up and down across uh, different patterns and things. So it's going to get fun. All right, and that's just the saw wave. You can play around with drive with the different samples and the other different um, oscillator configurations that you have and experiment with that. But those are some nice options. So really, we've just gone through the entire filter section. We didn't talk about this uh, knob here or this knob here, but that's going to be covered in part four. 
uh, because those have um, a whole nother meaning and um, they can go deep. It re really does require its own video. All right, but I do want to finish this video with the vibrato. Vibrato modulates the pitch of the oscillator to produce natural sounding vibrato effects. So there are three basic methods you can use to control the synth vibrato, which is set using the selector button in the vibrato section. If you're using one of the delay modes, delay one, delay two, or delay three, the vibrato is introduced after a short amount of time, increasing with each setting after a note is played. The vibrato amount of the delay modes is set in the sound menu as well as the rate for the vibrato modes. Read more about this on page 53. So those first three delays, and we'll talk about where those settings are actually in the sound menu so that you wouldn't necessarily think about the, where this is actually being affected by a menu down below here, but it is. And then you have the wheel, that's vibrato as dictated by the wheel, and this sort of overrides anything that might be in the sound settings. So um, full wheel is full vibrato. So let's take a look at that flute here and play this. And when I put the wheel all the way up, it is a uh, full vibrato and then this is the aftertouch so as I push a note and push harder that's when my vibrato kicks in so it's really interesting you can trigger vibrato just through this delay mechanism uh, and it affects your keyboard that way you can choose the wheel or the aftertouch so delay one a little bit of delay a little bit more delay there it is and finally the most delay so it's hard to tell in this particular um, example. Let's just use a sine wave. There's a better way of doing it. Now you can hear the difference between the non-vibrato and vibrato delays, different delays. Okay, so let's take a look at this uh, closer. You can go to your vibrato settings here if you hold the shift button and push sound. And you'll see here you have a rate of a vibrato as well, and that goes from four to eight hertz. So let's listen to that. Let's put it on delay one for my vibrato. And there's a four hertz, and as I speed up the vibrato, it's dictated here under these settings. And no matter what I choose, what type of vibrato I choose, let's choose the wheel type, the rate is always dictated by the sound settings here. Now you can lower the rate and slow that vibrato down. Okay, the amount on the other hand, only uh, dictates the vibrato for delay one, two, and three. That's where the amount is dictated. So if I have a, a drastic amount here, that's pretty drastic at 50 cent, or I can go down to let's say eight cent and have it barely noticeable. However, the amount when you use the wheel function or the AT style, uh, this amount is meaningless. It only um, uses the amount based on where the wheel is. So as I'm moving my wheel up, it's having more of a dramatic effect. Or in the case of aftertouch, the harder I push, we'll go from zero to 50 based on those uh, controls. Okay, so rate it dictated here through the sound settings. On, no matter what vibrato option you choose, the rate is always dictated here under your sound settings. That's page three of 11 under the sound settings. Remember, you just hold the shift button and push sound, go to page three and you'll get to your sound settings. And then your amount um, for the sound settings is for delay one and two and three, and then your wheel ignores the amount here and uses whatever the wheel is and the AAT uses whatever the pressure is. So hopefully that makes sense. So we've talked about filtering. We've talked about the frequency cutoffs. We've talked about the different types of filters, the KB tracking, the drive, and the vibrato. The one thing we didn't talk about too much is the resonance and what that does. So let's cover that real quickly. The morphable resonance parameter is used to further adjust the characteristics of the filter. Increasing the resonance will emphasize frequencies around the cutoff frequency, making the sound thinner. Further raising the resonance will make the sound resonant to the point where the filter starts to self-oscillate and produce a ringing pitch. Exactly where the frequency spectrum is ringing occurs depends on the frequency value. So let's take a look. The frequency, the resonance is that point where you have the cutoff and the resonance will accentuate the area around the cutoff, making for some interesting effects. And the higher on the resonance, the more effect it will have. So let's take a classic saw wave here and put the frequency to about a five and bring the resonance up. 
can see, it does some interesting things. And when you keep the resonance, let's say, at a 7 or 8 and move the frequency up or down, it creates some interesting effects as well. So you can play around with that. This is interesting because it's morphable as well. So we can have um, influence over that using pedals, using the aftertouch, or using the wheel, for example.